Um, I work at the Guildhall Art Gallery and this is one of my favourite things to talk about, Roman archaeology and not just Roman archaeology but London's Roman amphitheatre. And today I would like to tell you a little bit more about this amazing discovery, about the remains of the amphitheatre themselves and how this category of building fits into the wider picture of Romano-British amphitheatres. So let's get started. Um, I know that we've got a very international audience, so perhaps before I start talking about the amphitheatre in particular, I can just give you a little bit of background information about Roman London, or Londinium as it was called then. Um, the red arrow marks where the Roman amphitheatre is, just underneath the medieval guild hall and the guild hall art gallery and that sits on the northwestern side of what was the Roman city. Now the Romans came across or invaded Britain in um, AD 54 and they quickly settled um, London. Um, it became a trading settlement. They were attracted by the River Thames which was great for communications and also for trade. And this particular stretch of the River Thames, where the present day city of London is, was even more attractive because the land was slightly raised above um, the levels elsewhere along the River Thames. And the Roman engineers have worked out that this was probably the first spot that you would be able to bridge the River Thames. So this site was particularly attractive to the Romans and the city was probably founded around AD 50. Um, it prospers. One or two people don't particularly like the Romans. Some of you may have heard of someone called Boudicca, a British queen um, who burnt down Londinium in 59-60 AD, um, but it quickly gets rebuilt and it soon becomes the largest, most important Roman settlement in the province of Britannia. And it's embellished with lots of impressive buildings, the type of buildings we would normally expect to see <clears throat> in a Roman town. And these included um, the amphitheatre, which we look at in detail, but also um, sets of baths. Archaeologists working across London have found 11 sets of Roman baths. They're really into their bathing, um, including a large public set, which are down um, close to the River Thames on Upper Thames Street, a smaller set associated with um, a large, large Roman villa, um, which is slightly to the east of that on Lower Thames Street and various other places within the city. There was also a big forum or marketplace and a basilica, a seat of Roman government, and all of these impressive buildings were surrounded by a set of walls which stretched for just over two miles. And you can see here, we've got a map of the present day city. And onto that, we've transcribed some of these impressive Roman buildings. And for anyone that knows London, the Roman city went from um, just to the west of St. Paul's Cathedral, um, to in the east, um, the Tower of London, and it went back just beyond the Guildhall to the, the Barbican complex. So it was about a mile across and a, just under a mile deep. Um, there was also a bridge going across the Thames, which was just to the east of today's London Bridge. And the settlement on the south side of the Thames was more substantial perhaps than we originally thought. So lots of recent discoveries in the last 20 or 30 years south of the Thames, which make us think that actually that was quite a, an important part of Londinium as well. So a little bit of information for those of you who are not familiar with the Roman, the Roman city. And moving in a little bit, here we have a picture of the Guildhall Yard and in the distance you can see the new Guildhall Art Gallery and to the left of that um, you might just be able to make out um, with the unusual windows part of the medieval Guildhall. That's the porch leaving, leading into the medieval Guildhall. And then the courtyard and in the courtyard on the right hand side you might just see that um, in a dark stone in the courtyard pavement they've marked a line and we think that's where the um, arena 
that's the central part of the Roman amphitheatre would have continued. So as we will see, we've got a small part of it, which was found underneath the, the new art gallery, but that just gives you some idea of how big this structure would have been. It would have been a large and very impressive structure in Roman London. And I like to choose as my start date, 1986, um, because 1986 was the centenary of the opening of the first Guildhall Art Gallery. And the first art gallery um, was in uh, a repurposed Georgian court building on one side of the courtyard. You might just be able to see the, the same entrance on the left-hand side of this old photograph. And straight away, this was a really popular art gallery. I must point out, I hadn't noticed them before, but you might see lots and lots of pigeons sitting on top of the, on top of the art gallery. So some things have not changed. Um, and yes, it was a very popular, a very popular gallery. Um, we've got stories about people queuing up for special exhibitions and queuing all the way back to the Bank of England, which is like five, 10 minutes walk away. So numbers that we can only dream about today. Uh, the art gallery continued, but unfortunately during the Second World War, um, there was a lot of bombing in this part of the city. Uh, the Guildhall was bombed and the Guildhall Art Gallery also received a hit. And it was patched up after the war. There was a lot of building that was going on and this obviously wasn't one of the priorities for rebuilding. So it was patched up. And this is a picture that was taken by a colleague of mine who's just retired shortly before the work on the new art gallery started. And we can see that, yeah, it's, it's um, a shell of its former self. Um, so in 1986, or just before, to commemorate the centenary of the art gallery, they decided that at long last, they were going to refurbish this site and they were going to put a purpose-built gallery here. Now, as we've seen, um, the site lays within the Roman city. So before they could start work on the new art gallery, they just had to check that there was nothing of particular importance that was going to be disturbed by the construction of the, the new building. And over the years, there have been several small scale excavations in the vicinity of the courtyard. And um, for anyone that knows the site, just behind us, if, or from where this picture is taken, um, there's a 1970s extension to the Guildhall buildings, um, which must have been bang smack in the middle of the amphitheatre. And yet during those, or during that rebuilding, none of the amphitheatre have been found. So they assumed that when work started here, it was going to be a, a fairly routine excavation. But little did they know. Um, they started digging down and almost straight away they hit the archaeology. And they found burials from the 17th century, um, just behind or just behind where this photograph was taken from, there is a church, St. Lawrence Jury, and that was probably the cemetery associated with the church. Dug down a little bit further, they found the remains of a chapel, a medieval chapel that was connected to the medieval guild hall. Dug down further, they found the remains of houses dating to the 12th and 13th century. And then with time running out on their excavation window, across what was a huge great site, they decided that they were going to open six comparatively small trenches. So openings in the ground, about three meters by one meter, just to check that there was nothing of Roman date there. So they opened these trenches and lo and behold, they found Roman things. Well, at least they found Roman things in four of the trenches. Um, they found sections of Roman wall. Now, it wasn't immediately obvious to the archaeologists what they'd found. And I think this picture shows why there may have been that confusion, because this was a really difficult site to work, because the Roman levels are found about six metres underground. So a long way underground. Um, it's also a very large site. And it's a site that's been cut through or truncated by lots of later buildings. And we can see some of the foundations of those later buildings here. 
So when they uncovered in these comparatively small trenches, just small sections of Roman wall, it wasn't immediately obvious to the archeologists what they'd found. Uh, they had several more weeks worth of work before they were able to establish that all of these four sections of wall were built at exactly the same level. They were all built using the same construction techniques. So it looked as if they all belonged to the same building. And one of these stretches of walls was particularly important in this identification because one of these stretches of walls was curved. And you don't find too many curved walls in Roman architecture. The Romans like things straight. They like their roads straight. So when you find a curved wall, which is well built and over a meter wide, there's a fairly short list of buildings that it may have belonged to. So it was at that point they were able to announce to the press that they'd found London's Roman amphitheatre, a structure that we'd always assumed a city of London's importance would have, but no one had known where it was. So of course that was great news for the archaeologists and anyone interested in history. It made the headlines in the newspapers. Not such great news if you happen to be developing the site because the ruins were deemed to be of such importance that they were immediately protected or listed by the government. And that meant that the whole of the interior of the new art gallery was gonna to have to be redesigned in order that the ruins could be accommodated where they'd been found in situ. So an enormous task. Got another picture here, which again, just shows the difficulty of excavating here with small sections of wall and a site which was excavated to different levels across the whole site. It was also very wet and very waterlogged, as we will see in just one minute. So at the end of the excavations, basically this was what they uncovered. And it's an important part of London's Roman amphitheatre. What we have here is one of the principal entrances into the arena, the eastern entrance. And that curved wall that we were looking at in the courtyard, um, we can see part of that curved wall in the picture here to the left. And then we've got two long straight parallel walls and those were the walls that were on either side of the eastern entrance. And then flanking the entrance, we've got two small rooms. So an important part of the amphitheatre. Um, I'd also point out just how wet and waterlogged the site was, because that's important as we move forward. So let's just have a look at the part that the archaeologists found, the eastern entrance. So one of the principal entrances leading into the amphitheatre but probably one of the entrances that was used by the entertainers themselves rather than the audience. Um, we think that possibly the audience would have sat or accessed their seats from staircases, wooden staircases around the outside of the amphitheater. So if you were using this entrance on a day of the games, you were probably going to look quite nervous. You weren't really looking forward to what was going to happen. Now the amphitheater, uh, was discovered in February 1988 and there's been subsequent excavations just very small scale on one side of the courtyard when they found part of what they believe to have been the exterior wall of the amphitheatre and perhaps another entrance. Um, those have been preserved but they're not on public show. And if we look at a picture of how we think the amphitheatre would have looked, this is a wonderful reconstruction of London's Roman amphitheatre by the artist Judith Doby. Um, it shows not the first Roman amphitheatre on the site, um, but the second larger Roman amphitheatre. And I'll talk a little bit more about the chronology of the site as we go through the talk. But within the red box, we can see the eastern entrance, and then the arrows at the bottom of the image, they point towards the section of um, outside arena wall that was found during the later excavations. When I have pictures like this is, you've got a small section of the amphitheater, but 
but you've got a, a reconstruction of the whole of the structure here. How realistic do you think this is? And the answer is probably quite realistic because we might only have a small section of the amphitheater, but amphitheaters tend to have a fairly standard layer. Sorry, Andrew, I just muted everyone because there was interference and I, of course, muted you. you. need to unmute yourself, sorry. <laughs> sorry. Okay. Um, so we have just a small section of the amphitheater, but we have enough of the amphitheater with certainty to work out the overall proportions um, because there's a lot of Roman amphitheaters around the world which are much better preserved than the example we have here in London. So I think we can be fairly sure that this is an accurate reconstruction of how it would have looked. Ooh. And this is how the amphitheater looks today for anyone that's visited, you'll recognize it. Underground, we've got the ruins um, where they were found, they've never moved. And it's a very sort of dark atmospheric space. And we're standing from where the photograph's taken in the middle of the eastern entrance looking towards the arena and the walls on either side of the entrance you might just be able to see it on either side and then we've got a section of the curved wall at the end and I think it's quite a clever design particularly when we think about how long it's it's been here um, the art gallery itself opened to the public in 1999 and the ruins were opened up in 2001. So it's about 20 years old, but I think it still looks really good. Um, I like the way they've tried to reconstruct part of the amphitheater in the background. So it's as if we were looking across the arena to the entrance that there was no depth that would have been on the far side of the arena. And they show us some of the seating. My only slight quibble with the reconstruction is the green figures. Um, we quite often have school groups come down to the amphitheatre and they quite like our green figures, but it's very difficult to explain to a seven or eight year old why our green figures have no clothes on. Because perhaps, you know, we know what the amphitheatre would have been used for. It would have been used for wild animal hunts and gladiators. And yet here we've got our figures wrestling, but with nothing on. So if I was to change one small thing, it would be to make them look perhaps just a little bit more like gladiators. So some armour and some, some weapons as well. But apart from that, I think it looks really good. And let's just look in detail about at a couple of sections of the excavations. Um, we saw in the photograph that was taken at the end of the excavations that it was a really wet waterlogged site. And that's really useful in terms of preserving things that we don't normally find in archeological excavations. So organic materials. And London's Roman amphitheatre, we found lots and lots of incredibly well-preserved Roman wood. And here we have an archeologist um, cleaning out one of the drains um, because in Roman times, this was a really wet waterlogged site. And in order to take away the water, uh, they built a whole series of drains. And there was one wooden drain going around the inside of the arena wall, another, another one going straight to where across the arena itself. And the water drained through the eastern entrance and down towards the River Thames. And the archaeologist is cleaning out part of that drain. But he's standing in a slightly deeper section, and that's a silt trap. And that was part of a really brilliant piece of Roman engineering, because the idea was that all of this would have been covered in Roman times. The water would have just been flowing through. Um, but with the silt trap, any debris that's been carried in the water would sink to the bottom of the silt trap. And as long as periodically you sent someone to take the lid off the silt trap and clean out any nasty debris that may have accumulated, you're unlikely to get blockages in other quite inaccessible parts of the drain. So a really interesting piece of Roman engineering. But this is also my favorite 
part of the amphitheater, not just because of the engineering, but because of what it can tell us about the amphitheater. Because unlike many well-preserved amphitheaters on the continent, um, we don't have <clears throat> big inscriptions from London telling us that the emperor, <clears throat> <clears throat> the emperor Claudius commissioned this amphitheater or the emperor Hadrian. So in terms of dating, we're reliant on other sources. And one really great source of dating for archeologists is wood. And the wood is so well preserved at London's Roman Amphitheatre that it can be very closely dated. So the archeologists look at the sequence of tree rings in the wood, which is a unique sequence. They can compare that sequence to a database. And from that database, um, they can work out when the trees were cut down or felled that were used um, in the amphitheatre. And from those, they can establish a date for the amphitheatre. So I've said when we looked at the picture um, that that was Londinium's second Roman amphitheatre. <clears throat> the first one we think dates from about AD 70. And the first amphitheatre was slightly smaller and it was built entirely of wood. And the reason that we can date it is because of this wood. But the wood is also interesting because it helps us to date the history of the amphitheatre so that we know that they're still making repairs to the drains about 250 years later. So if they're repairing the drains, that would appear to indicate that the amphitheatre is still being used. So London's Roman amphitheatre is being used into the fourth century. So once again, with those school visits, I can point out that not only is this London's earliest sporting venue, but it is amongst the oldest lived sporting venues in London as well. So the wood is incredibly important. Um, you also have those two rooms on either side of the entrance. And the one to the south is particularly interesting as well, because we think that that room would have been used for keeping wild animals in before they were released into the arena as part of the games. And the reason we think this is because we've got a wonderfully preserved threshold stone, so a stone that sits at the entrance between the room and the arena itself. And on that stone, cut on either edge, um, we've got a series of grooves cut into the stone, very deliberately cut into the stone. And from other better preserved Roman amphitheaters, we think that these grooves would have been used for inserting the lowest part of a vertically opening wooden trap door. So the wood would have been inserted into those grooves. And we have examples of this type of mechanism from other better preserved Roman amphitheaters. So we have a picture on the right hand side of how this may have looked. So that would suggest that this room was used for keeping the wild animals in. They would have been brought through the eastern entrance from the back of the amphitheater, through a door into the room itself. And then at an appropriate time in the games, the trap door would have been raised and hopefully the wild animal would um, spring into the arena, much to the entertainment of the crowd. So a really interesting feature there. If you were wondering about the room on the other side, of the entrance. Um, we have no particular evidence for that room. Um, it's not quite as well preserved, so it may have been used for keeping wild animals in, but I would just like to think that it may also have been used for the gladiators. Um, we know that um, at Roman Chester, in the amphitheatre there, in one of the small rooms which flanked an entranceway, they found a small Roman stone altar with an inscription across the front, and this inscription was de a dedication to the god Nemesis, the god of chance, the divine retribution. And that's one of the gods that the Roman gladiators would have made their offerings to before they went into the arena. So it's possible that the one on the other side um, was used for, for the gladiators. And for any of you who may have visited one of the better preserved Roman amphitheaters in um, the Mediterranean area, particularly the Colosseum, of course, um, that has lots of underground passages which would have been used for the same thing. 
Um, but that's okay when you've got a comparatively dry climate. But if like Roman London, um, it's wet, as soon as you dig down into the ground, you're going to find water. Having that sort of system underground is not going to work. So that's why another piece of evidence which points towards these rooms at ground level being occupied by the animals and the gladiators rather than anything else. So let's have a quick look at the seating. Um, the archaeologists didn't find very much of the seating. The first Roman amphitheatre was entirely of wood. The second Roman amphitheatre, when it was rebuilt, the one we have pictured here, was a mixture of wood and stone and brick. And the arena walls were stone and brick. The walls of the entrance were stone and brick. But all the seats would have been of wood. Um, so very little of that seating survived. Um, this is how we think it would have looked originally. It would have been a superstructure, a little bit like scaffolding with the seats at the top. And the archaeologists, the only bits of the seating that we found were small wooden post pads, which would have sat at the bottom of these vertical um, structures. And <clears throat> across the whole of the site, they found enough of these post pads to work out how far back the seating would have gone. And by comparing that to other better preserved amphitheatres, they were able to work out that there, that there was enough room for between 12 and 15 rows of seats. And again, using evidence from elsewhere, from that they worked out that there was perhaps enough capacity for within those 12 to 15 rows of seats for around 6,000 spectators. That was when the Arch that was when the amphitheatre was first excavated. Um, as with many things in arch with archaeology, um, the information has been subsequently revised. And now we think that um, the capacity of the amphitheatre would have been, we're sitting our Romans a little bit closer together, there's no COVID distancing here, the capacity would have been between seven and ten and a half thousand, so considerably more. And if we think about that in terms of um, the city of Londinium, um, we think at its height that may have had a population of between 20 and 30,000. So potentially we could sit half of the population within London's Roman amphitheatre. So a considerable percentage. And what went on in London's Roman amphitheatre? Again, we don't have very much evidence for that, but um, I think we can assume that it would have been all the things that you normally associate with an amphitheatre. There tended to be a programme of events. Um, in the morning, you would have had trained athletes um, fighting against wild animals. Lunchtime was for executions, something nice to have with your sandwiches. And the afternoon was when you really wanted to be there because that's when you had the big event, the gladiators fighting. And here we have a wonderful pot, um, which was made in Roman Britain and is now in the Castle Museum in Colchester. And this shows scenes from the amphitheatre. So on this side, we've got um, the trained athletes fighting wild animals. And on the other side, there's the gladiators. So a wonderful example. Um, but we think that London's Roman amphitheatre may also have had a secondary use. And if we just return briefly to this map of Roman London, um, we can see that the amphitheatre um, is very close to the Roman fort. And we think that the military may have been involved in the construction of at least the first Roman amphitheatre. And it seems probable that they would have used it as a parade ground, a nice, flat, well-drained area of ground. So London's Roman amphitheatre may also have had that second reuse. Um, in terms of other finds, we do have things which suggest um, perhaps the audience at the amphitheatre. Um, we have lots of Samianware pottery, this wonderful red pottery, often decorated. And here we have a, a nice example that's de decorated with two gladiators fighting. And this is the type of pottery that you'll find wherever you excavate an, a Roman period site in Britain. 
and they analyzed the finds of this particular type of pottery and they found that an unusually high percentage of these finds, these shards, were decorated with scenes of the amphitheater. So it's possible that when you went to the games 2000 years ago, um, it would have been a fairly rare occasion. You might want to take home a souvenir, just as you might do with a football match or another match today. You might want to take home a souvenir. So what better souvenir than a nice piece of very practical pottery decorated with the scene of the amphitheater. So quite nice to be able to make those connections to the present world in some respects. Um, we also found um, several hairpins. Um, these are bone hairpins um, that would have been used by Roman ladies to decorate their elaborate hairstyles. Um, so this might suggest that our audience um, in the amphitheatre in London was a mixed audience, men and female. And the last find is part of a Roman necklace. Um, originally it was thought to be part of an earring um, and then someone else studied it and said no it's the clasp from a gold necklace. So it suggests that not only do we have a mixed audience but an audience that would have included perhaps elite Romans as well. So some really nice finds indicating who may have attended the games in Roman London. Now let's just go back to our picture of the end of the excavations and the story of how the ruins were conserved um, is quite amazing and it's something that's very easy to forget when you're actually in the site itself. So um, the Roman walls were built on naturally occurring gravel foundations and the first step in the conservation process was to wrap the walls in polythene as it was really important that the walls were allowed to dry out slowly to prevent cracking and other forms of damage. And the polythene allowed this process to be monitored and carefully controlled. Next, they built plywood boxes around the standing sections of wall and the space between the box and the walls, they filled with um, with foam to help reduce potential damage from, vib from vibrations. And here we have a picture of the excavations with the um, Roman walls nicely encased in their plywood boxes. Now the next step of the process was to construct a transfer deck above the ruins. And this structure was designed to accommodate all the heavy building equipment used in the construction and therefore to help separate the Roman levels from the building levels, so to help protect those foundations. Um, we can see the time scale. Um, it, it, was, it was some time later that the construction deck was actually built. And the next step was to carefully cut down through those gravel foundations, a safe distance from the edge of the walls, and to secure the outside of the walls with metal. So now we have our Roman walls carefully secured within the box. We have part of the foundations, or at least the side of the foundations has been secured. The last bit in the jigsaw was to preserve the, the bottom section of the foundations. And here's where it started to get really ingenious. They inserted perforated scaffolding into the gravel and they pumped in an epoxy resin, a type of glue. And once this epoxy resin had dried, it formed a secure base for the foundations. So now we have the box with the walls and the foundations secured. The next step was to put props underneath the walls. So underneath those secure walls. And once they'd done that, they added lintels. So horizontal props um, going across the site and these were bonded into the main slab of the first floor basement of the art gallery. So now we have the Roman walls, they've not moved and they're secured in what was going to be the first floor above the first floor basement of the art gallery. So once they've done this they carried on digging and they went down for another two floors 
so that today the Roman remains, which have never moved, they're about six metres below the level of the Guildhall Yard, they hang within the art gallery. And here we can see a cross section looking through the gallery and yeah, with those walls hanging in the middle. So the story of the conservation is almost as amazing as the discovery, but it's something that's very easy to forget when you're walking around the site. Lastly, I wanted to talk a little bit about the Roman Amphitheatre in Britain and how London, Londinium's Roman Amphitheatre fits within this pattern. Um, it depends on who you talk to, but at least 11 Roman amphitheatres have been discovered. Um, I know that we had someone from Dorchester and I haven't put Dorchester on there, but you have got a red dot to indicate Dorchester. Sorry about that. Um, and some of the best preserved of these are in addition to London, um, the amphitheatre of Silchester, Caerleon and Chester. So let's start off by having a look at a plan of these amphitheatres compared to the largest Roman amphitheatre, um, the Flavian amphitheatre or the Colosseum in Rome. Um, yep, we can see that that is considerably larger. Um, the length and the width is about twice that of the dimensions of London's Roman amphitheatre. So a much, much larger um, structure. But London's Roman amphitheatre does appear to be amongst the largest within Roman Britain. And that's something we would expect um, due to the importance of Roman London. And if we think a little bit about the different types of structure, um, because one thing that's apparent is that um, there's a great deal of variety in the way these amphitheaters were constructed. Um, we also have um, sequences of construction and refurbishment and rebuilding. So it's not just that London that we find a first and a second and possibly even a third amphitheatre. That's a pattern that happens throughout many of the Roman sites in Britain. But London's Roman amphitheatre, um, which may have taken advantage of the topography, the shape of the landscape, um, is largely built above ground. Um, so it's a freestanding structure. Um, we've seen the seats, um, they're raised up in this scaffolding like um, construction. Um, so most of it is above ground, whereas other amphitheatres, such as the one at Silchester, which I had, which I visited earlier on this year, um, they make more use of the topography of the layout of the land. And Silchester's Roman amphitheatre um, is excavated deeper into the ground for the arena and <clears throat> material from the arena is piled up around the outside of the amphitheatre to make a platform on which the seats would sit. So we can see in this secondary construction that it's, it's sunk within, within the landscape itself. Um, it's much less prominent as you approach it than perhaps London's Roman amphitheatre would have been. And most of these amphitheatres are a mixture of different materials. We've seen that with London's, initially wood, and then a mixture of wood and stone and brick. Um, the same with Silchester, but possibly the most elaborate Roman amphitheatre in Britain is the one at Chester. Um, there's been some excavations which have happened at this amphitheatre in the last few years. Um, we can see part of those excavations in the top here. And again, this is an amphitheatre that goes through a sequence of different building phases, but in its last phase, it appears to have been um, an entirely stone built structure. Um, so this is probably the one that most resembles those large um, amphitheatres that we're used to seeing on the continent. Um, you would have accessed your seats through passageways leading up through the structure itself and the seating would have been of stone or perhaps with, with wood on top of stone. So this was by far the most elaborate architecturally amphitheatre within the country. Okay, I've talked quite a lot about London's Roman amphitheatre and I'm always very conscious that, yeah, amphitheatres, it's not a really feel-good story, um, but I just wanted to end with sort of one one or two anecdotal stories about the amphitheatre. 
and to show how we use that space today. And one of the things that um, we've been lucky enough to have is several reconstructions of the games in the courtyard um, at Guildhall. And this one was taken a few years ago. And we can see that yeah, we've got the sand in the middle where the gladiators would have been fighting. And then we've got seats around the outside. And we've got approximately 1,200 people in the audience here. And I've been lucky enough to attend most of these games. And I can tell you, when you've got an audience of young people sitting out in the courtyard on a nice summer's night, it's quite atmospheric. Um, you can sort of start to see perhaps how the Romans would have got carried away. There's a lot of noise, there's a lot of energy going on in the courtyard. I also remember this particular games because um, we had one of the gladiators came into the guild hall and I'm a first aider and I had this gladiator coming into the guild hall part way through the games, all the kit, so very similar to the gladiators that we have pictured on the right hand side. And he came up to me and because I was a first aider and said, um, I've cut my finger, have you got a plaster? And it always seemed to me that that was such an un-Roman thing to do. Here we have these gladiators fighting to the death. And all of a sudden I had a gladiator asking for a plaster, yeah, for a cut, which wasn't very big. Um, we also have other activities which happen in the space of the ruins themselves. So one or two memorable ones that we've had over the last 20 years. Um, we've had art installations. Um, we had, it sounds a little bit strange, but an, an inflatable art installation um, with bits that went up and then deflated and then went up again. Quite a memorable one. Um, it's also been used for evening events and we've had tap dancing in the Roman amphitheater. And again, I do remember thinking to myself, I bet this is the first time that London's Roman amphitheater has ever been used for tap dancing. Um, it also gets used for a rest and recuperation area when we have evening events sometimes. So again, something that would be very alien, I think, to the Romans. Um, I've been waffling on for quite some time now. Um, I hope to have shown that um, London's Roman Amphitheatre, a chance discovery. Um, who knows, it would have been very easy if those four small sections of wall hadn't have been uncovered. Um, we might have been in a position where we still didn't know where Ro London's Roman Amphitheatre was. So archaeology, I think there's quite often an element of chance within excavations and that definitely seems to be true with the discovery of London's Roman Amphitheatre. I hope that I've also shown that the engineering to preserve the remains of the Roman amphitheatre within the building are absolutely amazing. They were cutting edge at the time and having spoken to some of the original archaeologists, they were using technology which had never been used before. And again, that's very easy to forget when you're standing down there. You just see the walls themselves. So an amazing bit of engineering. And also to have shown how this Roman amphitheatre fits within that category of Romano-British amphitheatres. Um, I'd like to thank you all very much for listening. I am I've got a few minutes to spare. So if anyone does have any questions, then I'll be pleased to try and answer them for you. Um, I might also mention that if you haven't had enough of Roman amphitheatres, um, there is another talk which I have planned um, which is looking into the planning, provision and performance of staging the games in a Roman amphitheatre. So not necessarily London's Roman amphitheatre, but some of the preparations which were extensive, which went into preparing for the games. And that talk's due to be held at the Artisan Street Library on Monday the 18th of October. So thank you very much for listening. If anyone does have any questions, then I'm happy to try and answer them for you.